Welcome to this evening's event, The Refugee in International Law, Then and Now. My name is Shukufa Tahiri and I'm a member of the Calder Center for International Refugee Laws Advisory Committee. I'm delighted to chair this event to mark the launch of the fourth edition of The Refugee in International Law, known amongst the Calder Center team simply as the book. The Refugee in International Law is recognized as one of the International Refugee Laws classic texts. In fact, the publication of the first edition by Guy Goodwin Gill in 1983 is widely known as seen as having established the modern field of international refugee law. At the time, the book was a mere 234 pages. Since that time, the book has grown to a hefty 864 pages. And Professor Goodwin Gill has been joined by Professor Jen McAdam as co-author from the third edition onwards. For this edition, though, Emma Dunlop, a PhD candidate at the Calder Center, joined as a contributing author. This book is an essential resource for scholars, legal practitioners, decision makers, and civil society. It has informed the jurisprudence of tribunals and superior courts around the world, including the High Court of Australia and the Supreme Courts of the UK, Canada, and New Zealand. On behalf of the Calder Center's advisory committee, I want to express how proud the center is to be the scholarly home of the authors who are recognized globally as leading scholars of international refugee law. This is the first of two events to launch the fourth edition. The second event will be held on 9th of November to coincide with the release of the book in North America and will feature contributing author Emma Dunlop and with Professor Guy Goodwin. They will discuss the law and practice of refugee status determination with RFU sign from the Refugee Advice and Casework Service. You'll find details of how to register in the chat function. Today, however, I'm delighted to introduce Ben Doretti, who will lead a discussion with two of the authors, Professor Guy Goodwin Gill and Professor Jen McAdam. Ben Doretti is a reporter from The Guardian Australia. He was previously a foreign correspondent covering Southeast Asia for The Guardian Australia and South Asia correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. He has won three Walkley Awards for his foreign affairs and immigration reporting. Professor Guy Goodwin Gill is Professor of Law at the Calder Center and the Emeritus Fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. His distinguished career has encompassed not only a pioneering contribution to the academy, but also practice through his advocacy in the courts, contributions to parliamentary and international committees, and his engagement with civil society and UNHCR. Professor Jen McAdam is a director of the Calder Center and is recognized for her outstanding scholarship on refugee law, particularly in relation to displacement in the context of climate change and disasters. This year, she was appointed as the officer of the Order of Australia for Distinguished Service to International Refugee Law, particularly to climate change and the displacement of people. And at this stage, I'll give it up to Ben um, Doherty, who will lead a discussion with two of the authors, Professor Guy Goodwin and Professor Jen McAdam. I will join you a little bit later for the audience Q&A section. Um, and so Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for that generous introduction, Shakufa, and good evening, of course, to Guy and to Jane. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I'm not quite sure. It's, a, it's some sort of dream for a student as, as mediocre as I and as someone who spent a long time with the, uh, the third edition of this book. I'm now the proud owner of a fourth edition. So uh, it's a great honour um, to, be, to be here tonight and to be in, in conversation with its two authors. Um, can I start? We might go back to the beginning here to, to start, Guy. Can I start by asking you... What, what motivated you to sit down and write that first edition? Where was the, the need you saw? And I suppose to follow on from that, what has changed today, some 20, nearly 30 years later? What, what's motivated a fourth edition? And is the world in a better state? Is, is the global protection framework in stronger shape than it was when you first sat down in 1983 with your quill and your parchment to, uh, to, to write the first book? Yeah, that is a good question. And the answer, is, as Shakufa and as you yourself have mentioned, begins here in Sydney 40 years ago. I was then the UNHCR legal advisor sitting as an observer on the DAWES committee. DAWES was Termination of Refugee Status Committee. We had little to go by in respect of country of origin information, a, a pile of newspaper articles, copies of minority rights group reports, the occasional UN document, and even less we had on, on what we now call international refugee law. There was Atlee Graal Madsen's two volumes, The States of Refugees and International Law, and a volume of cases from the French Commission de Recours. Graal Madsen was written in English, and it was not really user friendly. And some of the positions of principle seemed out of date when faced with the problems then arising in Australia and the world. What was needed, I thought, was a short, 
manageable handbook that would be useful primarily for me and my colleagues in UNHCR when deciding refugee status, when sitting on the doors committee or its equivalents. And refugee status determination was just then beginning to take off or when intervening to prevent the reform of refugees. So that's what I wrote, never thinking that I'd be back in Sydney 40 years later, working with Jane and Emma on a fourth edition. What's changed? A whole lot. In particular, as I mentioned, refugee status determination has become legalized and judicialized everywhere. And the 1951 convention, particularly the refugee definition, is the most highly litigated treaty in the world today. You can see that just looking at the Cable of Contents, the first edition, from just two pages of cases in 1983, we moved to 22 pages in 2021, smaller font, larger pages. The numbers of those in search of refuge has grown too, from five to six million to over 20 million, but the search for refuge and protection is now as hard as it ever was. In fact, it's become harder since the end of the Cold War, which ironed out many of the efficiencies of the refugee definition. So while in some respects, though lasting meaningful solutions are as far away as ever, the global protection framework is in fact stronger. People understand that refugees need protection. Mm. Increasingly, they know what the law requires. Courts are generally open, both nationally and regionally. And advocates and NGOs are ready, prepared to go into bat to insist on government accountability to international refugee and human rights law. So in many respects, Things have changed and things are still the same. I mean, uh, your uh, your short handbook I, I see now is just a, is a quiet seven hundred and eighty six pages. Now you can you can see the the, the sort of breadth of of, um, of of refugee law sort of growing with with every edition as it goes through. I'd, I'd like to talk, I suppose, about some of the the major developments since the third edition, which which uh, you and you and Jane wrote. Um, Jane, climate change, displacement, and displacement caused by disaster are significant elements in, in this fourth edition. Now, these have been major drivers of displacement for a significant period of time, and there's this uh, developing body of international law, the Nansen Initiative, the Sydney Declaration, and, and others. And more is emerging, and, and, and I, I've written, I've, I've read pieces, rather, that, that you've read that say um, more needs to be done. Um, the, the, the Sydney Declaration suggests, and I quote, government should consider creating new domestic and regional laws and agreements to facilitate temporary, circular and permanent migration. This is an area of law that's going to continue to grow. And, and I suppose, why is this issue so critical now? Well, it's fascinating actually, Ben, when I think back and realise that the third edition said nothing about this phenomenon at all. Uh, it was only as the book was hitting the press in early 2007 that I first really contemplated the legal questions thrown up by this topic. And five years later, in 2012, I published the first book examining the capacity of international law to protect people displaced in the context of climate change and disasters. But to answer your question, the reason why this is so critical now is because the adverse impacts of disasters and climate change are already prompting millions of people to move every year. In fact, three times as many people are now internally displaced by disasters than by conflict. And that means in numerical terms that last year, nearly 31 million people were displaced in their own countries because of disasters. It's quite striking to note that more than half of this was in our own region of the Asia Pacific. And in fact, in the last decade, that's where 80% of disaster displacement has occurred. Of course, as climate change exacerbates the frequency and also the severity of disasters, we expect to see a lot more people on the move. Extreme events are only going to become more extreme. The once in a decade flood will become a far more regular occurrence. And we know too that the people who are generally the worst affected are those who are already living in quite precarious circumstances. So essentially, as you pointed to in your question, we need to find ways of enabling people to stay in their homes when that's what they want, but also to find ways to let people move elsewhere before disaster strikes. And of course, to receive protection if they are displaced and fundamentally at whatever stage they find themselves at to have their rights and dignity respected, including through a secure legal status. And you also pointed rightly to some of the important legal and policy frameworks that have uh, been developed over the course of the last decade or so 
And I think what we've all come to appreciate is that while there certainly are some legal gaps uh, to protect people displaced in this context, there's not a complete void. And there are also many effective practices that governments could implement right now to address migration um, and other forms of mobility in this context. The challenge, of course, is as always getting them to do this. In short, preparation's key. And I remember the, the former Prime Minister of the Cook Islands saying, if we fail to plan, then we plan to fail. So we need a toolkit of responses from disaster risk reduction through to climate change adaptation and beyond, which enable people to find protection when they need it, but that also let people take charge of their own lives so that migration itself can be a form of adaptation um, that can build up people's resilience, that can enhance their lives and livelihoods. And all the evidence supports this. Um, for instance, in Australia, if only 1% of the Pacific's population were permitted to work permanently here, this would bring more economic benefits to the Pacific than Australia's entire aid contribution. So I think um, looking at the data, compiling good, good practices is going to be crucial to put forward the evidence to encourage states to, to start to take action. And just to do a shameless plug here, if people would like to know more about this, then the Caldor Centre's annual conference that's happening as a virtual event from the 19th to the 21st of October is on mobility in the context of disasters and climate change, featuring experts from all over the world, um, from international organisations to scholars to communities affected on the ground. Uh, and we'd love you to join us. I think a link to, to that will be placed in the chat now. I'm just interested in that answer, Jane. If, if we can go back and, and look at one little element of that, you, you mentioned there's this sort of emerging toolbox, I suppose, this, this body of law. It, it, it seemed to me you, you were saying that it's not necessarily that that's lacking, but it's more the sort of political will from governments to, 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 uh, to respond to these issues. That is the, uh, the, the, the key stumbling block, I suppose, at the moment. Certainly, we need more action by governments, and I didn't want to suggest that the that the law is all sorted and it's it's fine. I mean, we need um, you know national migration laws, for example, to be um, expanded or reformed here. Um, but I think when we began researching in this area, the the general well, there were two things: either people would talk about climate refugees, and then people would, like me would jump in and say, well, you know, that's not legally accurate. Mm. Um, but the terminology is still used, and it is not legally accurate. However, I think what we've come to appreciate is that international refugee law may have or does have a role to play. So while climate change on its own doesn't force people to move, it's always uh, in relation with other, um, other factors. factors. Yeah. Disasters happen in a social context. So um, they can enhance vulnerability, they can enhance persecution or discrimination and interact with factors that themselves could found a refugee claim. And UNHCR last October issued a document um, of legal considerations trying to um, articulate this a bit more clearly. Mm -hmm. um, human rights law has a huge role to play here too and the UN Human Rights Committee in October 2019, I think it was, um, issued a, uh, a view the case or the, the matter was called Tessiota and New Zealand and there they accepted that in principle states do have obligations not to send people back to places where their lives are at risk or where they would be at risk of cruel inhuman or degrading treatment on account of the impacts of disasters and climate change. Okay. Well, there's a um there's a new chapter in, in, in the fourth edition, um, again, shameless plug, fourth edition, here it is, um, on statelessness. Now, statelessness is not a, a new phenomenon. We, you and I have spoken about this before. Greek city-states would, you know, banish unwelcome people. The Roman Empire would drag it in chains to the edge of the empire. Um, uh, and there have been international treaties on statelessness for, for decades. Why did you see the issue of statelessness as, as critical for this edition? Well, statelessness was always in the book, but it was incidental. It was not a main topic. International refugee law, when it began in the 1920s, began with the statelets, those who did not enjoy the protection of their former country of nationality or of any other country of nationality, the unprotected. But the notion of refugees gradually took over. And now it seems to me it's time to redress the balance. There are two major treaties, one which largely matches the Refugee Convention, and the other which aims at the reduction of statelessness. Since the early 2000s, UNHCR has actively and successfully promoted 
ratification and implementation of these treaties and procedures for determining statelessness are now beginning to take root. At the same time, statelessness is often the excuse for states to rid themselves of unwanted minorities, as we see with the Rohingya in, in, in Myanmar, mm. or of troublesome individuals. Deprivation of citizenship appeals to uh, certain governments, in each case without regard to the rights and interests of those involved and of other states. So there's a clear link to refugees, the need to protect the unprotected, and hence the necessity for a chapter to signal that more needs to be done. This, the, you, you mentioned there um, the, the stripping of citizenship um, or sort of denationalisation. This is the uh, Shamarama Begum case. This is the Neil Prakash case. Are you seeing a, or are you concerned by a, a rising uh, trend in that, a, a, that, that, that being used as a, as a, as a, a sort of lever that the government's pull to sort of rid themselves of, of citizens they'd rather not have? Yes, I am. There is a, a rising, a rising concern. Well, my concern is, is very high in that regard because of the rising phenomenon of, of mm. statelessness of deprivation of citizenship. And I see this as something which is in breach of international law because it, it, it offloads people onto other states for no reason that they could understand. Mm. And that is the problem. It is contrary to international law. You wrote um, recently, Guy, reflecting on this edition that, um, and I quote here, faced with the strengthening endorsement of basic principles, states seek ways and means to prevent arrival by physical obstacles and by visas, carrier sanctions, denial of disembarkation, or by often spurious arguments that someone else is surely responsible. It's a very Guy Goodwin Gill sentence, that one. Um, have I got your argument right here? Are you saying the, the refugee convention is, is clear and is strong about the rights and protections owed to a refugee who reaches a territory and makes a claim for asylum. And therefore states are, are seeking to get around that by doing what they can to prevent people from ever setting foot on their territories in order, in order to avoid those protection obligations kicking in. Yes, uh, one of the ironies of the international system, which is incomplete when it comes to the universal protection of human rights is that faced with such a powerful rule as non refoulement the rule that prevents, mm. prohibits the return of an individual to face persecution or the risk of, of serious harm. States now expend so many billions of dollars putting obstacles in the way of movement and trying to prevent the rule ever being triggered by the fact of an individual arriving in their territory. Not only obstacles, but active practices of prevention, denying rescue, preventing disembarkation, pushbacks on sea and on land, Detention without trial, denial of medical aid, ill treatment, all of this is done with impunity. And mm -hmm. as those in power know well, is prohibited by international law. As David Miliband, the CEO of the International Rescue, Rescue Committee said last week, accountability and rule of law are in retreat globally. And meeting that challenge requires action by governments, yes, but also by civil society at large especially when, as he had added, governments are in retreat from big problems, which is a major issue. We need to redress the balance between national self-interest and humanity, and how we deal with refugees and asylum seekers is one key to the wider issues. To insist that there are other ways than detaining and damaging people, that the individuals who willfully promote and implement such policies, among others, will be held to account, and that such policies do not become the new normal. Are you concerned, Guy, that those policies, though, are becoming the new normal? I mean, we've we've seen the uh, the Home Secretary in the UK, Priti Patel, talking about an Australia solution, talking about the use of Gibraltar or Ascension Island for offshore or, or offshore processing. Um, these sorts of policies, in certain circumstances, in certain political climates, can appear very attractive to governments. Are, are, are you concerned? Contagion is not quite the right word, but but these the, these policies seem to sort of circulate. Um, and, and take root in one country and once established, then, then, then find sort of fertile ground in others as well. They do appeal to certain governments indeed, but the advantage, if you like, in the UK is that there is a human rights act and that certain provisions will be ruled out. Now they'll have to be litigated, which is where the book comes in to some extent. But nonetheless, at the moment we are on a downward slide, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. to recover in the future uh, when governments can see that their interests and the solutions for refugees and migrants lie not in detaining people indefinitely, but in finding solutions cooperatively and collectively with other mm. states. 
to both of you, to, to Jane and to Guy, this book, as, as you mentioned, Guy, has a very serious application in, in, in instances um, uh, where, where, where you know, you're looking at, at governments and their new policies. But th this book is designed for use by a, a broad sweep. It's for use by scholars, by judge, for lawyers, judges, um, struggling students like myself with reading lists that I can never get to the bottom of, international organisations. It, it, it exists for both scholarship and practical application. How did that, I suppose, shape your approach about the issues you chose to engage with them and, and the way you went about that, knowing that you had this very broad audience to speak to. Jane, would you like to take that? Sure, I can I can begin. Well, um, then I think, you know, fundamentally, it's a work that is anchored in and given authority by its very deep scholarly analysis, but with global and practical application. Um, as Guy's explained before, it's above all a handbook, albeit a rather large one now. Um, but it's a handbook for governments, for lawyers, for international organisations, for NGOs and for society at large. It's about what drives people to seek asylum and how, how they should be treated. Fundamentally, we're concerned with protection and the legal principles that underlie and underpin it. The animating force of the book, I think, is to identify the sources of obligation to which states have voluntarily committed themselves. And I don't think we should um, shy away from the fact that it is about voluntary commitment to these uh, duties. These duties not to remove people to places where they have a well-founded fear of being persecuted or a real risk of being subjected to other forms of serious harm. And while we are certainly passionate about our subject matter, the analysis is dispassionate, grounded in a scholarly and doctrinal analysis of international law. We've tried to take a very forensic approach that's keenly attuned to historical context and to detail, while simultaneously being alert to emerging principles of law and the direction in which we suggest the law might develop at times. To have relevance and utility, the book has to engage though with contemporary and real life issues and to take state practice into account. At times, we are deeply critical of some of those practices, given the all too common violations of incontrovertible principles of international law that we see around the world. Now, from what I've said, a lot of this might sound quite far removed from the day-to-day -day realities of displacement and from the refugees and other forced migrants who are the focus of our study. Yet each edition of the book has been informed by practical experience. As Guy mentioned, the, the very first edition was largely a response to that. And the book has had a real and direct impact on when and how refugees and others are protected on the ground. So the book's used by lawyers advocating for their clients seeking asylum. It's used <clears throat> by UNHCR and by national officials determining whether or not a person has a valid protection claim. And it's also informed the decisions of judges all around the world, including in the High Court of Australia, the UK Supreme Court, and many other courts. Guy, do you have anything further on, on, on no, that? No, I couldn't. I, I, I agree, absolutely, as you might expect, with what Jane said. Um, yeah. I mean, did, did, did you ever imagine it would get to, to become to a fourth edition and, and become this, this sort of totemic work that, that it has become? No, and to, to be honest, it was only after several years that Ian Brownlee, who was my doctoral supervisor, mm -hmm. said in passing one day, one must keep one's books up to date, you know. I realised it was time for a second edition. And so that was the 19, that was the origin of the 1996 edition. But no, I hadn't expected. I thought it was a one-off. To follow on from that, can I ask uh, uh, again to you both, I suppose... I'm, I'm fascinated, you know, 786 pages, I think it is. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work. What are the nuts and bolts of, of, of writing a work like this? For those of us who have never written a textbook, who have not had that, that singular joy, how do you go about finding, verifying sources, deciding who are the authorities to put in, who to leave out? Um, perhaps, Guy, you'd like to give us a, a treatise on your unalloyed joy and footnoting. <laughs> uh, well, let me take the first point. Updating, um, verifying, it, it just happens to a large extent. It happens because you're teaching, because you have to keep an eye on the world to be up to date for your students. It happens when you're supervising doctoral students. Uh, they teach you a lot. They bring cases to you. They bring problems to you. Um, I was also in practice for 16 years, and uh, so that brought case law to my notice. And before that, I worked with UNHCR for 12 years, back some time ago, as you might have gathered, which meant I had and still have good contacts and an excellent exchange with officials, both there 
and in other UN and regional agencies. The material was not hard to come by. The grind came with the analysis and then feeding it into an updated edition 14 years later in this case. Um, frankly, footnotes can sometimes cause me to shudder, particularly um, heavy footnoting, as one of our uh, proofreaders mentioned at one point. And the occasional page, thank goodness it is only the occasional page, when you find five lines of text and the rest is footnotes, um, cause me great concern. On the one hand, this seems to me to undermine the original object and purpose of the book, which is to provide a succinct account of the principles of protection, to analyze the jurisprudence, and then to extract the essence in a way that is useful to, to the reader. On the other hand, I recognize that much has changed since the first edition, and that those who use the book to defend and to advance protection will often need to have the latest sources at their fingertips in order to combat governments in court, legislators in committee, and officials in practice. So we have to compromise, and I hope in a way that that compromise contributes to the process of international legal development. Jane, the nuts and bolts of, of writing this book. Well, I guess um, it's funny because my dad used to say to me, how, how do you know how to do this? And in a you know, very unhelpful way that only a, a daughter can, I'd say, you just know how to do it, Dad. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it was a big undertaking. And I think, um, it, yes, of course, while we're trained in, in, in how do we approach and, and write in this way, um, there's an awful lot of material globally to, to try and cover. And I suppose what I'd add to um, Guy's comments is that all of what we do happens in a context in which the field is constantly evolving and expanding. So um, in the first and second editions of the book, 1983 and 1996 respectively, there was one chapter devoted to the principle of non refoulement that's the cardinal protection principle of non-removal to harm. In the third edition in 2007, we added a second related chapter called Protection Under Human Rights and General International Law, which looked at states' non refoulement obligations beyond the Refugee Convention. And now in this fourth edition, the original non refoulement chapter has become two chapters, and we still have that additional chapter on non refoulement in human rights and general international law. So essentially um, three chapters. And uh, I was curious, so I had a look. Together, just those three chapters are longer than a PhD thesis, so over 100,000 words. So that in itself gives you a sense of what writing the book mm. was like. Um, just in terms of length, that book is equivalent to four and a half PhDs. And on that, <laughs> yeah, that's why we type. Um, <laughs> on that, I'd like to acknowledge Emma Dunlop, who is a PhD student at the Caldor Centre, whom we brought in on this occasion as a contributing author. Emma's forensic skills of analysis, her ability to be across relevant judgments from numerous jurisdictions and to uncover obscure legislation was such an enormous asset. And she was an exceptional person or is an exceptional person to work with. And I have to say her calm demeanor and unflappability were always appreciated. Excellent. Well, it, I mean, it, it, it feels like, Guy, the, uh, the, the future's in, in sort of good hands with, with Emma coming on and you can have, you know, three bylines on for the fifth and sixth and seventh editions as they, as you progress. I see Guy shuddering quietly there. Um, look, I've, I've got a couple more questions uh, for those listening. I've got a couple more questions for Guy and for Jane, but then Shakufa is going to come back and guide uh, an audience uh, uh, Q&A session. I urge you to kind of start thinking of questions now and to put them in the chat. Or, uh, and, and to get in touch and, and be ready. Um, this is your chance to, uh, uh, to, to quiz the authors about this. Um, and I would, as, as I say, um, highly recommend. It's, it's a terrific book. Like I say, I spent a lot of time with the third edition going through university and I look forward to getting reacquainted with the fourth. Um, Guy, can I ask you, um, we have an immense and, and, and um, divisive um, and polarised debate uh, around the issue of forced migration um, and refugee protection in the world. Is international law still relevant in this field, given what we see governments around the world doing around the world to, to constrain the rights of refugees and people seeking asylum? Is international law still relevant? If there was no convention, would the problems go away? Evidently not. Refugees and those in search of refuge or a better life would still be with us and would still require answers. 
Yes, international law is still relevant and of concern to us all, not just to states. The 1951 convention is not perfect, but it provides, as we show, a principal basis for states to respond or other elements in the regime of international protection. Let's not for, forget that the convention does not stand alone. Other elements in the regime of international protection include UNHCR, the Executive Committee, the UN General Assembly, other members of the United Nations, non-governmental organizations and civil society, all provide both the forum and the mechanisms in and through which governments can cooperate to find solutions. At the present juncture, it will be for the private sector, for NGOs and civil society to insist that they do so and that they live up to their obligations. And uh, to Jane, um, uh, the, the, the same question, essentially, I mean, what is the state of international law where it relates to, to refugees and forced migration, uh, forced migrants? I am. Um, I remember, I'm embarrassed to tell this story now, but um, I remember saying to you once, you know, with the sort of assured confidence of someone who doesn't really know what he's talking about, that the Refugee Convention, 1951 Convention was ineffective, it was impractical, it should be abandoned. And you very calmly asked me, well, with what would you replace it? And, and your argument being that in the, in the current global political environment, a treaty that might replace it, that, that, that states might consider signing up to would undoubtedly be weaker and, and, and less effective. I, I suppose, yeah, my, my essential question is what is, what is the state of international law where it relates to refugees and forced, migra forced migrants as we, as we sit here in September 2021? Well, as I said in my previous answer, I think it's constantly evolving and the Refugee Convention itself has proven to be very dynamic and flexible in that regard. Um, I mean, just back to what you were reflecting on um, in your question, I think that very often we do see the blame laid at uh, the feet of the Refugee Convention, um, but in my view, as a treaty that's been signed up to by the majority of the world's governments, the problem here is not an absence of good law, but an absence of political will to implement that law. And I think, you know, as the book itself shows and perhaps why it, it keeps expanding is that the Refugee Convention enshrines timeless protection principles that have and, and continue to adapt to new contexts of displacement over time. And that's why, um, even as I said in the past decade, the application of refugee law to people fleeing the impacts of climate change, that's moved along in, in leaps and bounds. Um, and I think, you know, without an instrument like that, we'd see far more disorderly movement, as Guy has suggested. It's, it's not like abandoning that would suddenly make things clearer. It, it, it would make things far more disordered. Um, I think, too, that you know, it, it's obviously clear that the Refugee Convention on it by itself is not going to resolve the record levels of displacement that we see in the world today. Um, and, you know, we, we've only touched upon this, but uh, it's not only people who cross borders, it's people who are displaced within their own countries. Um, there are also people who don't even get that far. In other words, they're rendered immobile, they don't have the capacity to move at all. And, all those people's rights need to be uh, considered and, and respected. So it's the role of governments towards people within their own countries, as well as, of course, as, as we know here, you know, the, the role of governments towards those who come in, in search of, of protection um, that they have undertaken to provide. So the Refugee Convention offers that principled ordered framework for protection. It also offers the premise or provides the premise for international involvement and a measure of accountability. It provides a set of common understandings on which to build international cooperation to assist refugees. And I think abandoning it or, or trying to rewrite it at a time when displacement numbers are at a record high would be a retrograde step. So if I can just I guess, leave with a, um, a, in the 70th anniversary year of the Refugee Convention, um, signaling that it does remain fit for the purpose for which it was created, but it absolutely needs political action to implement and enforce it because otherwise it can't do its job. And you, you made the point uh, earlier, but it, I, I think it's worth reiterating. And it's often, the Refugees Convention is often by, by some governments um, sort of uh, framed as this sort of impost, uh, some, something that's that, that's sort of uh, that's imposed upon them. But but you, you reminded us earlier, Jane, that it's actually something that governments voluntarily sat down and wrote and signed up to and 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 ratified. This is this is something that the Australian government and other governments all around the world have agreed to be bound by. Absolutely, 
And the other thing to point to remember is that governments have come in later and later to say it is still recognized as valid. Not, mm -hmm. It's not fixed in time in 1951, it has evolved and states ratifying it in 67, in, in 77, in 87, in 1997, recognize that it is valid today as indeed is the case. It is the basis upon which to develop protection principles. And, and if I could just um, add one more thing to that too, I think that's what's so interesting when you look at what governments say or what they don't say. And um, it's pretty rare to have a government actually say, yes, we are flouting the Refugee Convention. The fact that they respect it, they will go mm. to every possible length to say why what they're doing is in their mm. very odd view sometimes. Yeah complying with it. Um, so I think it shows the the um, power and the a force, import yeah. of, mm. of the law, even if it's it's not always followed. Mm. I'm going to invite, uh, look, thank you, Jane and Guy, both very much for your uh, for your time and and, um, and um, erudition in our chat. I'm going to invite Shakufa back now. Um, she will reappear on screens, I think. Um, and Shakufa is going to guide our, um, our audience Q&A. But thank you so much both, very much for your time. Congratulations on the fourth edition. Well done. I, I, I have absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of how much work went into this and, um, and congratulations on it. I look forward to the fifth. Thank you, Ben. The exam's coming. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thank you so much, Ben, for facilitating such a great discussion with uh, Jen and Guy. Um, we have actually quite a few questions coming through. Um, so I'm actually going to go to start with Guy and Jen. You both talked about this book as a handbook, not just for scholars, but for practitioners in civil society. What do you see as the role of civil society and the grassroots in advancing refugee protection? Um, Guy and Jen, go for it. <laughs> Guy, would you like me to jump in? Or... Yes, please. Do. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's absolutely fundamental. I mean, I think uh, this is not a field that in which any one um, intervention dominates. It's got to be uh, a collective approach, if you like. So as scholars, we have a particular role to play, um, but we also need grassroots activism. We need policy advocacy. We need the international organisations doing their work. Um, you know, we need uh, NGOs, we need broad community um, public support. And I think, you know, all those things together are, are going to have a more powerful impact. Um, but, you know, no one personal entity can be all of those things. And, and that's why I think that uh, we can each help to inform each other in that in this kind of ecosystem um, about refugee protection. To which I'd add that the major developments in international protection have come from the grassroots. The development of the refugee definition to encompass protection for LGBTIQ+, for example, began at the grassroots. The protection of women facing the FGM began at the grassroots in decisions by tribunals and then in superior courts. That's where it, that's why I, why I place the emphasis on the importance of civil society at large in developing, contributing to development of international refugee law. Um, uh, thanks. Uh... If I could go to you again, Guy, um, if by magic you could go back in time and be present at the drafting of the Refugee Convention, would you add or change anything in that instrument? And then I'll um, hear from you as well. Um, well, yes, I would. I mean, and I'm for, I, I could give you a whole list of things I'd change if I could, but I can't, so I won't. <laughs> Uh, I think the most important thing is, is the refugee definition. I think I don't know exactly how I'd change it. I'd add maybe a few categories of, of fear of persecution. But I think I'd also want to bring in into the refugee convention already the notion of complementary protection, protection from uh, return to danger at large, to danger, fear of return to danger of from, from armed conflict, uh, through the danger of discrimination, those sorts of issues I'd like to bring in. Well, I, I certainly can't argue with that. <laughs> um, it's funny because I, I would sometimes set an exercise for students where I would pretty much say this, you know, imagine you are now there drafting the convention, but you are representing governments, um, as is the case, what do you do? And um, what's fascinating is that, whereas at the beginning of, of the course, people would be saying, this definition's ridiculous, why doesn't it include X, Y, or Z? When people were put into that position, like, this is really hard. We can't agree on, on things. Um, and I guess that, yes, if you were present right at the start, there are things you would ideally have added, but there are also 
good reasons, or not good reasons, there are pragmatic reasons why they weren't. And I think one of the major deficits of the convention is the fact that it doesn't really say anything much about international cooperation and responsibility sharing. Um, and we we have seen all too clearly uh, how that has, has played out. Um, but it's also not accidental. I mean, the, the reasons why we still haven't achieved a uh, huge, well, you know, relatively we have achieved, uh, um, you know, we've moved on in, in some respects, but I think um, states themselves don't want to bind themselves in advance to, to having to take certain numbers or certain proportions of refugees. Sovereignty is still very much a player. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's such uh, an important um, element to, you know, um, the current situation. I think that the crisis, the displaced, the rate of displacement, the number of refugees displaced from their homes currently is unprecedented. And I think responsibility sharing is the spirit that we are truly missing, especially when in light of, you know, refugee crisis happening right now in Afghanistan as well, if you actually um, think of a current example. Um, a further question that has come in um, is, would an international court competent to adjudicate on refugees refugee status or stateless person status be desirable or feasible? I would go with you, Guy, first. Yes, I've been around this debate for many years. Uh, in fact, it was generated by a, 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 former, Austra a, a former Australian judge who wanted to, uh, the establishment of a court of, of experts, noble experts, who would pronounce this, that, and the other. I don't think that's in the presence of, of, in the presence of international society. Um, that's not going to work. Um, mainly because there's not a great deal of difference of opinion on the, the legal interpretation of key terms. There's a difference of opinion on the application of the refugee definition to particular factual circumstances, and that's a major challenge. But to have a court pronounce on each and every difference, that I, an international court pronounce on each and every difference, is going to be very time consuming and very time wasting. I don't think that's the way to go at all. I think we have to find a way, something a bit like the European approach, which has, has, has not worked, but nonetheless, something like that, whereby we can get agreement on in common interpretations of terms and then common agreements, common agreement on factual situations so that we can accept that, that if you come from this country with that, this or that profile, you are more likely than not to be considered a refugee. That I think is the way to go. Thanks Guy and Jen. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have a lot to add to that. Um, I've also followed those those discussions closely. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Guy that it's very often the, the factual, I mean, where we see some of the legal disputes, I think they're actually um, uh, false disputes in a way. They're often states trying to get out of an obligation that is very clear to absolutely everybody except them. Um, and it's it's not so, ma so much a matter of, of legal interpretation as, as the, the factual context. It's also why it's sometimes, I think, hard to, to grasp refugee status determination unless you're trying to, you've got an actual case in front of you. In the abstract, things can make a lot of sense, but when you've got the messy detail of an individual case, um, it, it can be much more, more tricky to, to see how does this definition apply in practice. Um, and again, we, there are very, very differing levels of, um, well, competence, but also um, process, fair, fair processes and processes for review in, in different countries. Australia was once a model for that, but, but sadly no, no longer. Now, the refugee definition does attract a lot of attention, understandably, but states use it to their advantage. They use it as a, a gate through which everyone must pass, and they're proud to do that. No, they say to their people at large, only those who pass through the gate of the refugee definition are granted asylum or allowed to remain. Well, that entails certain consequences, it entails that they must invest resources into an appropriate procedure, that they must comply with constitutional requirements of due process and so forth, which delays everything. Now, I think one has to ask whether, in fact, this is the right approach. For states, it's convenient, but is it the right approach? Is it not a better way in which we, in this country, in Europe, and elsewhere, could do the job of protection? Is there not a faster way by which we could determine that those who come to us are or are not entitled to protection? I think there is. But I haven't found it yet. Mm. And that takes me of how vital are human rights charters and courts, for example, as Europe has 
and Australia does not um, in ensuring refugee protection. And if I can start with you, Alan. Sorry, did you say me? Cut yes. out. Okay, good. Um, yes. I, I think they're, they're fundamental. I mean, you shouldn't need them as well, but, but quite clearly they provide um, considerable additional protection. And as Guy said before, some of what's being proposed in the United Kingdom at present um, will eventually, if it, if it goes through, will eventually be surely struck down because of its inconsistency with um, the Human Rights Act and in turn with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, in Australia, we don't have either a, a national human rights charter, nor do we have a, a regional one. And um, I think very often that's how the government here has simply said, well, we can we can do what we like. And it doesn't actually operate like that. The, the international human rights treaties that we've again, voluntarily ratified, make quite clear that a number of our uh, practices are not lawful as a matter of international law. And were we trying to uh, carry them out in a region where we had a, a human rights instrument similar to that of Europe, uh, we simply would be told, well, it's a violation, very clear violation. And go. No, I have nothing to add to that. James, James said everything that needs to be said at this juncture. Mm. Well, the next question we got is, one feature of the Australian legal context for refugees is a large and growing amount of executive discretion to make decisions affecting refugees and people seeking asylum. Is this unusual or is it something that we see in other contexts? Could, could I maybe begin there? Um, Sure. Which is it? Well, it just it reminds me of, of sitting in a, um, a a meeting in the Americas some years ago, and we were talking. It was to do with uh, environmental movement, and essentially, it, was, it wasn't drafting a treaty or anything like that. But it was drive, uh, drafting some guidance, if you like, about what states should do if they were faced with people coming across the border after some sort of terrible disaster and it being unsafe to return home. And there was a lot of discussion there about having, giving officials the discretion to do certain things. And coming from the Australian perspective, I was very nervous about that because discretion in Australian refugee law has generally been used to deny protection, to deny rights, to act as a, um, you know, an absolute gatekeeper. Uh, and, and yet, in this other context, discretion was seen as a very positive thing because it allowed flexibility. It allowed um, quick action to be taken. So I think discretion on its own is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It depends on how it's used. And, you know, before the, what I did my doctorate on was complementary protection um, under Guy's supervision. That is the, the human rights basis for not sending people back to harm. And until... Um, relatively recently, Australian law didn't have anything like that in it. It was all about the minister deciding. And I mean, that the ministerial discretion is still there, but at least we have complementary protection in the legislation too. But prior to that, um, if you didn't satisfy the refugee definition, but you were at risk of torture, there was no way to found an asylum claim on that basis. You had to go through the refugee process, go through the appeal process, be rejected, and then eventually make your way to, um, to seeking the minister's discretion. And that was only granted in, very, in, you know, in relatively few cases. So um, the, a former immigration minister said it was like playing God because essentially he had the power to control who got to stay and who got to go. Yeah, the, the concept of discretion, which I've always worked with since I was doing my doctorate back in the day, was one which sees discretionary power as confined and structured by law, which implies there are constraints. The law confines discretion. It tells the decision maker what can and cannot be done. And it structures that discretion. It tells the decision maker how to go about reaching that decision. Whereas here in Australia, it seems to me more often than not, the, the executive discretion means something completely different. It means the power on the part of government to do anything it wishes, good or bad. And if the courts don't like it, to change the law, which is worrisome. Mm, thank you. Um, uh, another question we have here is, states in the global south host the majority of the world's refugees, but we increasingly see states in the global north engaging in policies of externalization. How can this be addressed and how can we advance international responsibility sharing for refugee protection? Uh, 
Jen, if I can go with you again, and then we'll go to Guy. Well, I mean, this is this is one of the challenges of not having a clear uh, statement, if you like, about or agreement about international responsibility sharing. And quite clearly, I don't like using the language of burden sharing, but that's a very common phrase because mm -hmm. I don't like thinking of refugees as burdens. But if I use that language, clearly the global south is carrying that a huge financial uh, and environmental and uh, you know burden of hosting very very large numbers of people without that support and I think the more that global north states and I include in that this country we're in right or oh, I'm in right now um, you know the more that we try and externalize and push back the borders the more we are essentially saying you know to the rest of the world not our problem and and because the global south states are the neighbouring ones that people cross into, uh, that's where people then become stuck. Now, that is not within the, the spirit of the Refugee Convention. Uh, it was never intended that somehow the convention would only apply in, and, and very often, uh, at times it's not even ratified by those countries, but it was never intended that the Refugee Convention was a free pass to countries, you know, like Australia that were an island with no land borders. That wasn't the idea at all. Um, and, you know, international cooperation can mean a lot of different things. It's about um, capacity building, it's about uh, financial support, but it is also about um, alleviating the um, very real difficulties that countries um, in the global south are experiencing when they're ho hosting large refugee populations. And what surprises me is that, for example, let's take Europe, um, is that they don't appear to have learned from the experience of 2015, 2016, when Turkey uh, was being denied sufficient uh, access to funds to enable refugees, the millions of refugees in Turkey, to live a decent life, to provide an education for their children. And the consequence was that many hundreds of thousands decided that they'd have to go elsewhere. That is going to happen again. The investment needed is essential if this is to be avoided. Um, we've also got to realize that refugees are not necessarily here temporarily. They are here indefinitely. We need to build on that. We need to invest in an indefinite future for them. They may go home tomorrow, in which case we are the winners. They may go home in five years or 10 years. They may not go home. If they go home at a later date, we are the winners again because we would have provided them with education. We would have provided them with the resources to build back better. But unless we do that, then we are doomed, I think, to repeat the cycles. And if I could just jump in there. And, and Guy, I know this isn't what you meant when you... Uh, made that comment, but I think, you know, if refugees stay, we can also be the winners because we know, you know, just in Australia, for example, but this is parallel to around the world, that, that refugees make enormously valuable contributions to the, the societies that they, they settle in. And at the moment, we are not enabling that to happen. And I think to recognise, um, you know, the the human capacity that's there in front of you. And of course, it depends on people's circumstances. No one's saying somebody who's just come out of a, you know, experience of, of extreme violence and torture is suddenly there ready to become the next Einstein or something. Nobody means that. Mm -hmm. But we have huge untapped human capacity that we are squandering by not uh, enabling people to flourish. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Guy. And I think um, in light of that, um, uh, we are we have always lived in a world where crisis and displacement has been part of the reality, um, really, of the civilization. And I suppose um, on which note, um, I really think that it's time to think uh, more uh, pragmatically and, um, you know, uh, legal instruments and the legal framework uh, nationally, but also internationally should reflect that because that is the reality that we're dealing with. And I am personally really excited to um, actually receive the textbook from you, Jane. Um, and I think that on that note, I really like to thank our speakers for the fascinating conversation that we've had. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to congratulate Guy, Jane, and the contributing author, Emma Dunlop, for uh, the wonderful achievement that that is the fourth edition of the refugee law, the refugee in international law. Um, thank you to the publisher, Oxford University Press, from whose website you can purchase the book. You can find details in the chat. Thank you to the team at the Calder Center, particularly Francis Nolan uh, and Lauren Martin and Francis Wu for bringing this event together. Please remember that we will have um,
a second event in November to mark the release of the book in North America, which will be a conversation between co-authors Guy Goodwin and Emma Dunlop on refugee status determination, together with Arif Hussain from Refugee Advice and Casework Service. Um, and we have some other excellent events coming up at the Calder Center, including a panel next Thursday about the role of scholars with lived experience of displacement in the academy. In our upcoming Calder Center conference, of course, on climate change and mobility taking place from 19th to 21st of October. Please keep an eye on your email to or visit the Calder Center's uh, website for details of those events. And finally, thanks to you, our audience, for joining us this evening, and we hope you have enjoyed the discussion, and we look forward to welcoming you to another Calder Center event in the near future. Thank you.